I think it is clear to believe in the power of ideas. Fresh thank you to the Manhattan Institute. My name is James R. Copeland. Um, many of you know me. I'm the director of the Center for Legal Policy here at the Manhattan Institute. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to welcome you here tonight to our panel discussion, Constitutional Law After Obamacare, or really more appropriately after Sibelius, the, the Obamacare decision. Uh, but we wanted it to be understandable to the non-lawyers in the room. And we also welcome all of those who are watching on live stream or, or on a, a video recording on the internet after the fact. Uh, we've got an outstanding panel here tonight uh, to consider this question. I'd like at the outset to ask everyone, please turn off your cell phones, beepers, or what have you, so that, so that they won't be interrupted. And our panel tonight sort of is in the spirit of the Manhattan Institute's uh, legal policy efforts historically. And by that, I don't mean that we've done a lot in the area of constitutional law. We haven't. The D.C. think tanks do that. Uh, but what I mean is uh, we approach our legal questions from a fairly interdisciplinary uh, standpoint. That, that's the case for our current scholars. And going back to when we, we, we got in the legal area, we brought in uh, Walter Olson, who was an economist by background, not a lawyer, uh, and, and sort of outside the box thinking that's required to, to question things like the, the federal rules of civil procedure and, and personal jurisdiction and things that, that you take for granted when you go to law school. And then Peter Huber, who was a lawyer but was also an engineer by training uh, and it was quite that training that, that led to his seminal work uh, reconfiguring how the federal courts handle scientific evidence. Uh, similarly here tonight, we, we've got uh, some of the, the top constitutional theorists, we've got private law scholar, we've got a practitioner, so we've got a, a broad array uh, of folks on this panel. What, what unites them all is they've written very distinctively on the topic here before us and, 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 and more broadly the topic of where constitutional law is and where it should be going. Um, to my immediate left here, uh, only in terms of seating on the panel, I might add, is, is, um, is, is, is Dr. Professor Michael Grieva uh, of, of George Mason University Law School and, and uh, longtime affiliate and, and now visiting scholar with the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, Professor Grieva also uh, served a distinction directing the legal efforts with one of the top public interest law firms in constitutional law, the Center for Individual Rights. Uh, he's, he's the chairman of the board of the Competitive Enterprise Institute uh, and is, is really a, a specialist in, in uh, if I had to, I'm going to put each of these folks into boxes, and, and, and I, but, but, but I, I want you to realize that these boxes, that, that these folks all could fit to some degree in most, if not all, of these boxes. But they do come at constitutional law from distinctive perspectives, uh, and, and it's important to realize that, the, 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 the thought process, they're all right of center, so to speak, really? uh, on, the constitutional, <laughs> uh, on the constitutional theory framework. Uh, but, but come at it from different perspectives. And federalism, the federalism project at AEI is what uh, Michael Grieva directed. And it, it, it's really the federalism box uh, that, that he thinks about. And he's uh, obviously written also, his book is available, his recent book is available uh, outside for those who want to, to buy it. Um, to, to his left, again speaking only, only locationally, is, is Adam Friedman. Uh, who is a, a blogger with Ricochet and with the Manhattan Institute's pointoflaw.com web magazine. And he really comes at this book from the standpoint of a private practitioner working on a lot of economic legal questions similar to those that we at the Center for Legal Policy tend to focus on. Uh, but he has written a lot uh, on this area and most recently uh, has come out with a book, The Naked Constitution, which really comes at constitutional law from an originalist perspective. So you often hear originalism, original meaning, original public meaning, original intent, uh, not all of these are exactly the same, as a way to frame constitutional discourse. Well, this is, this is sort of the, 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 the MO behind Adam's book, which is also available outside, 
and, and I think will be proved very readable, very readable for you. His, his earlier book on legalese, trying to simplify legalese to the average reader, was called uh, The Party of the First Part, and one plaudits from, from none other than, than uh, William Sapphire for, for its readability and its lucidity, and I, I would encourage you all to, to take a look at Adam's book as well. Um, to, next to Adam, we have Nicholas Quinn Rosencrantz, uh, a, a, a friend of mine dating back to law school, uh, and, and a constitutional law scholar, a professor at Georgetown University Law School. Um, I, I'll, I'll note that Nick took virtually all of the constitutional theory sorts of courses at law, at law school, but I also uh, shared a class with him in the economics of corporate law with Henry Hansman. And that's really a lot of, uh, law and economics is, is basically what I do now, and, and with our new proxy monitor project uh, is uh, the economics of corporate law, specifically what, what I do to a significant degree today. Um, I, I'll just note that while Nick is a constitutional theorist, having read some of his reaction papers in that course, he clearly could have made an enormous impact in this area of law that I focus on as well. The inverse is not the case, uh, but, but I, 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 I don't view that as, 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 a, as much of a criticism uh, given that Nick is, uh, I think without question, uh, the most significant constitutional theorist right of center uh, under the age of 50. And, and the only real debate there uh, is, is whether right of center is a necessary qualifier, because, because I would argue that perhaps it's not. Um, his writings in this area, he's got a forthcoming book next year uh, encapsulating these writings, but his, his two articles, The Subjects of the Constitution and The Objects of the Constitution, look at the grammatical texts of the Constitution and, and, and use the, the grammatical structures as an interpretive methodology for making sense of all this stuff that confused me when I took federal jurisdiction with Nick back in law school, things like ripeness and mootness and standing and all these sorts of things where the doctrines really don't make a lot of sense. They, they actually start to make more sense when you read Nick's articles. Uh, and so he'll, he'll ex explain some of that. What I'm going to put him in the box of the textualist, uh, although the other boxes could, could arguably fit for, for Nick as well, but, but, but this is really a textualist type of constitutional interpretive methodology that... that, that uh, Nick champions. And then finally, uh, we've got commenting our, our, our longtime friend, visiting scholar at the Manhattan Institute, uh, Richard Allen Epstein. Uh, Richard is, for his day job, the Lawrence Tisch Professor of Law uh, at, at New York University <coughs> Law School. He's also got an endowed uh, fellowship, the, the, the Peter and Kirsten Bedford Senior Fellowship at the Hoover Institute. Uh, and, and Richard is one of the top five most cited law professors uh, in the country consistently, uh, he, and, and those who write substantially in the area of private law, in other words, outside the constitutional law issues we're talking about today, he's the most cited law professor nationally. And it's really that sort of interesting twist that brings Richard into this discussion, because he's, he's not a constitutional law scholar per se. He, he, he made his mark in, in, in scholarship. Uh, <laughs> He may object to that, but he said that very thing when we had him a year ago debating Larry Tribe. I will remind people in the audience. But, but he, I mean, he made his, his intellectual contribution, his first mark, in the area of tort and product liability, which is why he obviously fits in very, very closely with what we think about at the Manhattan Institute. But probably his most famous book is his book, book Takings, The Power of Eminent Domain, or maybe his subsequent book, Simple Rules for a Complex World. He's written so many books, it's hard to say what's the most powerful. But a lot of these books that people really know coming from Richard Epstein talk about the constitutional framework and interpret them. A, a private law scholar uh, thinking about private law dating all the way back to Roman law, as he could talk to you about, uh, blueprinting that, uh, juxtaposing that against our, our constitutional law framework. Uh, always uh, uh, interesting to listen to Richard. And he sort of brings the libertarian scholar's perspective, I think, onto this. Although, again, these other, these other uh, descriptors could also apply to him significantly as well. So at the outset, instead of the order next to us, I'm going to start with Adam, who's got the new book talking about basically why our constitution, how our constitution differs from the original constitution and whether we should worry about that. And I'll, I'll turn it over to Adam now. Thank you very much, Jim, uh, and thank you for mentioning the book. Uh, it is on sale, just, just outside there. Um, and I'd like to thank the Manhattan Institute. Uh, it really is, uh, it's an honor to be on a panel with such distinguished scholars. I actually thought that at some point I kept worrying that they were going to figure out that my book doesn't have any footnotes and they're going to withdraw the invitation for me to be on the panel, but I'm here now and it's too late. Um, 
So I am, as Jim says, an originalist. And for those of you who aren't steeped in this kind of thing, that means that I think that the courts and the Congress have a duty <clears throat> to apply the Constitution, uh, each, each provision of the Constitution, as it was originally understood by the public that ratified it. Um, and although I am a, 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 an originalist and a, a textualist, uh, I think that uh, even I would concede that one has to have some principle outside of the Constitution to explain why I think originalism is so important. Um, because that's the one thing that the text doesn't talk about. Um, so by way of introduction, I'm gonna start with the observation, famous observation of George Washington, who said that, who observed that government is not reason. It is not eloquence. Government is force. Uh, government is a forced association. It's not like the Century Association. You can't come and go as you like. Uh, there are no free drinks. No nibbles that they hand out. It's a forced association. Um, and I take it as a first principle that consent is better than force and that personal liberty should always be maximized for a whole bunch of reasons that Professor Epstein has explained much more lucidly than I ever could. Um, but I will take that as a first principle. And yet, we know that we'll never have 100% of the people consenting to 100% of what government does 100% of the time. Um, and so how do you deal with this issue of consent? Well, I would argue that our founding fathers did it in sort of broadly in two ways. First, they required an extraordinary majority of the American public to first ratify the Constitution and then to amend the Constitution. Uh, the, the Constitution can be changed any time. I'm not against changing the Constitution, but only with a very broad consensus. Secondly, at the federal level, the founders limited the extent of this forced association by clearly enumerating the powers that the central government would have. Um, and as Randy Barnett and others uh, have pointed out, although Randy sort of does it very eloquently, the primary purpose of having a written constitution is to constrain political actors. Um, in, in, in Britain, where they famously have an unwritten constitution, they also have the supremacy of parliament. So a bare majority of parliament can undo any constitutional principle, at least in, in theory. And so at that, at that point, why bother with a written constitution? Here the situation is different. We have a written constitution. And by codifying certain limits on government power, uh, I would argue that it's the codification that helps to ensure that the limits stay in place over time. But the, the durability of the constitution only works, uh, I would argue, if the uh, people who apply the constitution keep faith with the original meaning. If the meaning of the text, if the meaning of the Constitution's <clears throat> text is fluid, what the proponents of the so-called living Constitution would argue, um, then the scope of the government's power will inevitably be defined by whoever happens to wield the most power at any given time, which is exactly the result that the written Constitution tries to avoid. It's the rule of law, not the rule of men. Um, and so I, 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 I'm, I'm not an academic, uh, as these distinguished gentlemen are, Constitutional law is rich in terminology and different interpretive schools because um, people have sort of an infinite number of euphemisms to describe their yearning to break free from the founder's vision of limited government. But I would argue, uh, and perhaps I'll argue tonight, that, that any approach that does not uh, purport to uh, keep faith with the original meaning of the Constitution's text is essentially the living Constitution theory. It's a theory that says, that the meaning of the Constitution can change from day to day. Uh, today's Thursday, maybe it means something different from what it meant Wednesday, and, and who knows what tomorrow may bring. Um, I, think that's, uh, I think that's a dangerous theory. Um, with the living Constitution, the power to impose that forced association that is government gets concentrated in a very few hands uh, in the federal judiciary and in Congress, and uh, that it's not what the founders envisioned, and I would argue that's not the way our republic should be run. That's a good introduction to this framework, and we'll, we'll, we'll get a little bit more into some of the specific examples from Adam in a second. I want to turn it over now to, to Professor Rosencrantz uh, 
Tell us a little bit about uh, your scholarship in this area, specifically the, the, the subjects and objects of the Constitution articles that, that look at the textual structure of the Constitution and how they might shed light on uh, what the court's doing right and what it's doing wrong. Great, I'd love to do that. So thanks so much for having me and for that generous introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here at Manhattan Institute. Uh, so I've written these couple of articles, the subjects of the Constitution, the objects of the Constitution. They're in your little packet on your chairs, and they are, I'm combining them and expanding them into a book, as uh, Jim said. Jim's explained to me that we have both lawyers and non-lawyers in the room. I've talked about this thesis at uh, length in other contexts, and I find I get um, very different reactions from the lawyers and the non-lawyers. And so it's a, interesting to talk to a room that has a mix. Uh, for the lawyers, this thesis is radical and revolutionary and actually kind of too crazy. It couldn't possibly be right. It's shocking in that way. To the non-lawyers, it turns out that it's um, so kind of obvious that it's hard to imagine that somebody could get tenure for an idea like this. <laughs> like it actually seems utterly kind of self-evident. So um, this, is a, this is an idea that uh, everybody actually w was kind of born thinking, and then it gets drummed out of you in law school. So I'm going to try to uh, explain that actually your instincts about this are dead right if you're the non-lawyers in the room. It's a really kind of a simple idea. My claim is that different clauses of the Constitution bind different actors, and that it's crucial to figure out which clauses bind which actors, because it's, it will change the way we think about um, both the, the structure of the litigation under the clause, and then also the substance of the clause, quite what it is actually that the clause is doing, quite what the substantive uh, right is. Um, and uh, the court is, our constitutional dialogue is in the habit of eliding this, eliding this question that I call the who question. It seems to me to be the first question in any constitutional litigation. Who are we talking about? Um, are we talking about legislative action, Congress? Are we talking about the president? Are we talking about the courts? Are we talking about the state level or the federal level? So, you know, governors, state legislatures, state courts. Who actually are we talking about? Um, you, you know, you'll maybe be surprised to learn that courts are in the habit of eliding this very basic uh, question. So the language that we use in law schools and now in, you know, in op-eds and in civics classes and really all over is um, uh, this statute violates the Constitution or this statute doesn't violate the Constitution. Obamacare violates the Constitution or doesn't violate the Constitution. What I want to say is this is uh, imprecise and actually kind of wrong in a really fundamental way. This is this statute violates the Constitution is like saying this gun committed murder. Statutes actually don't violate the Constitution. The Constitution binds certain actors from doing certain things, from taking certain actions. So the right language to use is something along the lines of Congress violated the Constitution by enacting this statute. Or perhaps the President violated the Constitution by enforcing this statute in a particular way, or maybe the courts violated the Constitution by interpreting the statute in a particular way. And we've adopted this sort of euphemism, this statute violates the Constitution. It's odd, you know, the courts are, as a general matter, believe that accountability is crucial to the system. That is, it's crucial for us, for we, the people, to know quite who it is we're talking about. And yet, in constitutional dialogue, they actually elide this question. They avoid pointing a finger quite with this euphemism. This statute violates the Constitution. Um, uh, you know, what I would say is um, just using the proper language, just using words like Congress violated the Constitution, the President violated the Constitution, has the great advantage of um, holding our elected leaders accountable, figuring out quite who it is we're complaining about. Because actually, if Congress <laughs> violates the Constitution, that's a, if your congressman uh, violated the Constitution, that's a fine reason to vote against him in the next election. If your president violated the Constitution, that's a great reason to uh, vote against him. Might be, in an extreme case, a good reason to impeach him. It's actually kind of crucial to figure out 
who it is we're talking about, if for no other reason than accountability reasons. And then it turns out to actually matter substantively, the important substantively. And I'll just give you a quick example or two quick examples, and then I'll, um, I'll, um, I'll stop. But so um, here's a simple example. The First Amendment says Congress shall make no law. Now that's how it begins. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion and so forth. Now, here's the part that lawyers find shocking, that undergrads find incredibly obvious. So I claim, again, the words, language of the Constitution, Congress shall make no law. Here's my radical claim. I claim that clause binds Congress. <laughs> I claim the clause is about Congress. It's actually not about the president. It's not about federal courts, not about state actors. That clause binds Congress. Lawyers find this shocking. High school students find this obvious, right? So I claim this, the First Amendment's about Congress. Congress shall make no law. Lots of things follow from that. So um, what that means, so that, that's our answer to the who question. The when question follows. When, was the, when is the First Amendment violated? It's violated on the day when Congress makes a law that, say, abridges the freedom of speech. Changes the way we'll think about the litigation, right? If Congress passes a statute saying um, you can't give a political speech in the park, and then you go and give a political speech in the park, and the president arrests you, um, the litigation will have nothing to do with your facts. It won't matter quite what park you were in or what exactly your speech was or anything like that. It's not a fact-specific inquiry because the Constitution was violated years before, maybe, on the day when Congress enacted this statute. It wasn't the FBI arresting you. That's not the violation. It's Congress making the law. But um, not every clause works that way. So the Fourth Amendment, for example, which forbids unreasonable searches and seizures, that clause actually does bind the executive branch. That's about executive action, the president's action. So if Congress passes a statute saying the FBI can search you whenever they want to, and then the FBI breaks down your door and searches you, now the constitutional violation is that moment. It's the moment when the FBI does the search. That's the unreasonable search. So the inquiry is going to be fact-based. It's going to be about, you know, was it 2 in the morning? Did they break down the door? Did they shine the flashlight in your face? All those facts matter because that's the violation. It wasn't the enacting of the statute. So what I want to say is something that really should, be, should have been obvious to you before you got to law school, which is the different clauses bind different actors, and these differences matter. So we should spend some time figuring out who is bound by which clause and why. It's a simple idea. Thanks so much, Professor Rosencrantz. So we, we've, I think, got an, a, a good sort of overview of, of the originalist theory and then, and then the textualist theory, particularly this textualist application. And, and, and while it, 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 it does seem obvious, so many of the great ideas do, I want to point out. I mean, Adam Smith wrote a massive tome on economics and never figured out the theory of comparative advantage, what seems obvious to us today. And, 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 and none of the other constitutional theorists and scholars have thought of this idea that Nick's articulated here. So, so it, is, it is, I think, revolutionary, but, 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 but incredibly insightful. I want to turn over now to uh, Professor Griva uh, to talk about uh, federalism. And, and, and Professor Griva, I would say, is, is not an originalist or a textualist, but he clearly is a federalist. Uh, I'll let him clarify or, or correct me to the extent I'm wrong on that. Uh, but, but he can tell me why, from a federalist perspective, the courts are getting it wrong and sort of how he's thinking about these questions. I'm a public meaning originalist with a twist, no olives. Um, um, let me talk about sort of two or three federalism problems. Um, all of them are illustrated by the Affordable Care Act and NFIB versus Sebelius. All of them are very serious and they extend much beyond that particular act. Um, my instinct is to start in these matters with the constitutional architecture. So what's distinctive about the constitutional architecture as distinct from the Articles of Confederation? Well, this one one learns still, I think, in high school. This is supposed to be a government over citizens and not a government over governments. So what that means is citizens, the federal government may tax and regulate citizens directly, not through and with the intermediation of the state. There are two reasons for this. Uh, one is that a government over a government is feckless and ineffectual. And the second is that you can't monitor government that is a joint product and an intergovernmental 
conspiracy. This is what the Supreme Court calls an accountability principle, which I believe to be correctly derived from the Constitution. And if you doubt the force of these considerations, look at the EU. It's very hard to tell whether the EU ruined Greece or Greece ruined the EU. Uh, it's probably both of these propositions are right, but you can't <laughs> figure it out, and that is the Wonderful. sort of state of nature, so to speak, <coughs> in, uh, in, in these government over government systems. Now, it turns out that proposition, it's a government over citizens, and the federal government doesn't act on states but on citizens, is not exactly right because the Constitution itself frequently acts on states. States can't tax imports and exports. That's a regulation of states. Congress can regulate states in the sense of preempting them um, under the Supremacy Clause. Uh, so the key distinction is not exactly acting or not acting on states. The key distinction is between acting by means of a prohibition, don't tax imports, exports, you are preempted, versus which is okay within the uh, bounds of enumerated powers and on the other hand, an affirmative command. Do this, do that, do the other thing. Uh, get your budget in order, get your house in order. Um, that is not a way in which uh, the Constitution uh, envisions the federal government to act upon states. So those are the constitutional entitlements, preemption within the enumerated powers. That's okay, prohibitions. Commandeering, as the Supreme Court calls it, is out of bounds, is verboten. The basic modern day case that stands for that proposition is Prince versus United States. It's a decision written by Justice Scalia, which I think is one of the high points of the Supreme Court's uh, federalism jurisprudence. Now come the problems. Here's the first problem. What do you do uh, with a statute that says the following? We could preempt you states entirely and run our own program in this state uh, but we'll give you a choice. Either we come in and run the program or you regulate in accordance with our instructions. That's the exchanges in the Affordable Care Act, which curiously were not part of the original Obamacare litigation but are now. Um, you get from those kinds of conditional preemption statutes, as they are called, all the, the bad consequences of a government over governments uh, that the Constitution is meant to avoid, and so the question you have to ask yourself, are these conditional preemption statutes constitutional? And I believe that the answer may well be no. That is not the answer the Supreme Court has given to date, uh, but that um, bears, I, I think, sort of watch this space um, in connection with the uh, um, Affordable Care Act or maybe some other statutes such as the Clean Water Act. Here are the second and third problems. So the constitutional entitlements are clear, right? Preemption is okay and commandeering is not. The question is, can institutions bargain around the entitlements? Can the federal government offer dollars in exchange for commandeering? Uh, these things are called conditional spending or conditional funding programs, and the answer is yes, uh, institutional actors can bargain around the entitlements. That's Medicaid, education funding, and all the rest of it. Uh, there are, however, special rules that the Supreme Court rightly applies to these uh, uh, arrangements. First, they're contractual, not supremacy clause statutes. They're in the nature of a bargain, as the Supreme Court has said. Second, if the states undertake obligations under these statutes, they have to be clearly stated in the statute that comes from the contractual construction, because when in doubt, you construe the document against the party that wrote it. Um, and the second reason for doing it that way for this, what, what the Supreme Court calls a clear statement rule, is that, look, uh, if any conditional spending program may be good or bad, um, uh, but the loss of transparency is a given, and so therefore you wanna make the statutes as clear as they can possibly be if you have to live with it. And the third implication is that these statutes, to my mind, can't be enforced by third parties unless the statute itself explicitly says that. Now, it turns out those are the rules we roughly have, and it also turns out that they're not enough, and that is what NFIB versus Sibelius illustrates. Uh, so the argument there was this expansion of Medicaid um, 
uh, is coercive. Uh, remember that the feds offered states 100 cents on the dollar for the expansion, and if they don't expand the Medicaid program consistent with Obamacare, they would lose all funding, and the Supreme Court mowed that down. It said uh, this is coercive, first, because this, was, this expansion was unforeseeable for the state. Second, this is really a new program and not really a Medicaid expansion. And third, this program is really, really big, so you can't really withdraw or say no. Um, maybe, I mean, if one of my fellow uh, members here on, on the panel or someone in the audience uh, can explain why this is coherent, that would be a first. I've yet to meet any lawyer who thinks this makes the slightest sense. Now, incoherence uh, is not necessarily fatal to my mind. I mean, I yield to no one in my embrace of half-baked doctrines so long as I actually have a decent result, but this one doesn't. Um, uh, it, this one doesn't, because what this does, so what, what Chief Justice uh, Roberts then said is, um, uh, look, you, you, federal government, can no longer threaten states with the uh, withdrawal of all funding, uh, right? If they consent to the funding, they, they'll get the 100 cents on the dollar, uh, but if they refuse to go along with the expansion, they still get the, the uh, existing um, Medicaid funds. Um, this is bad because the state's next move is to say, okay, Madam Secretary, Mrs. Sibelius, we will go along with the expansion provided that you cut a slack on the remaining population. Um, and what cutting slack means, uh, uh, give us more money, make the, the burden, make the program less burdensome. The ink wasn't even dry on this, um, on this opinion that Pennsylvania dinged 150,000 people off its Medicaid rolls and now negotiating uh, with, uh, with the feds to get them back on. Uh, the state said, uh, well, you, you, you threw off 150,000 people, and Pennsylvania said, no, it's only 120,000 because 30,000 were dead. Um, and they'll compromise on 300,000 and put them all on under the uh, much more generous funding formula that's out there. So the whole program, as a result of this de decision, will be a whole lot more expensive, and we don't really have uh, a grip on it. Um, here are the real pro problems, as I see them, with these statutes. So the first one is that most of these statutes, education, Medicaid, and all the rest of it, they're kind of old statutes, and the contractual metaphor doesn't really capture what's going on, because these are now bilateral monopolies, neither can withdraw, so the states complain about underfunding, and the feds complain about states shirking, uh, and both are right, and both are kind of wrong, and the only thing that satisfies all of them is pump more money into the system, which is what we've done consistently to no good results. So the contract metaphor can't really handle that, but we need a doctrine to handle these kinds of bilateral monopoly problems and the strategic behavior on both sides. And the second thing is, what's coercive about these uh, funding programs? Uh, is not so much the program itself, it's the fiscal asymmetry, because a state that withdraws from these kinds of programs, um, well, the citizens have to pay the taxes anyhow for these kinds of programs, and that induces states to participate in these programs. Um, the court understood that very well, because Paul Clement made that point in his briefs. Um, but it couldn't say that out loud, uh, and it couldn't deal with it, first because there's a bunch of old precedents, much beloved by Richard Epstein, actually not, um, uh, that, that, that stand in the way. And the second thing is that the fiscal asymmetry is true of every conditional spending program on the books and you couldn't handle that problem in this particular case. Um, and so both of these problems, uh, I think a lot will depend in the future on whether the court and the rest of us uh, can figure out how to get handle on these quasi-contractual problems and, the pro uh, the, the prob and, and on the problem of, of these fiscal asymmetries. Thanks, Professor Grieva. Uh, on that note, I'm going to hand it over to, to Professor Epstein. And uh, 
Obviously, Professor Epstein, those of us who've seen him before, he could he could spend the entire time here talking about just a narrow part of this subject if he wanted to, uh, and he could certainly talk about these questions of preemption and, and, and state powers. I, he actually co-edited a volume with Professor Grieva on this subject. I think he's going to limit a significant part of his opening comments here to uh, the rational basis test, which you may have heard of and how it applies to some of these cases, but but I don't know that for sure. So, Professor Epstein, tell us, tell us uh, what, what you've got on your mind right now. Well, I'm very happy to be last on this program. Program and what I'm about to do is to explain why it is that my status colleagues um, do not, in all cases, want to sort of take the bull by the horns or the thorn by the nettle or whatever the metaphor turns out to be. And the question in many cases with respect to constitutional law that is most important has nothing to do with original public meaning and nothing to do with particular provisions, but has to do with what is called the level of scrutiny question that is brought to these kinds of issues. And the basic argument is that we can have a ratio of three flavors. Uh, one of them is that we have strict scrutiny, so we read things closely and try to figure out why a constitution actually does two things. One limits government, the two protects property rights. Or in effect, what we could do at the opposite end of rational basis is to decide in effect why it is that the constitution wipes out property rights and expands government. Or we could try to take something which is vaguely in the middle, the intermediate scrutiny test. I'm gonna put that aside here because in practice when you get intermediate scrutiny, it's not midway between the two poles. It tends to be much closer to the strict scrutiny test. So what's the stake between these two things? Well, I mentioned something about a ratio. And essentially what you're trying to do is to ask questions about the errors of over and under inclusion of government powers. And so if you're a guy who believes in strict scrutiny, you think excessive government powers counts for 10 and insufficient government powers count for one. And if you're a rational basis kind of guy, you say, oh my God, under enforcement is terrible and private abuse is so enormous that you put the ratio the other way. So if you take over 10 over one and divide it by one over 10, it turns out there's a hundred fold difference, probably more in the level of scrutiny that you're going to use to these cases. And when the dust settles, the difference in the size of government will be more than a hundred fold to which way or another. So to make the point very clearly in this case, let me just talk about two causes of modest significance in the Obamacare case. One is the tax and spending power, and the other turns out to be the scope of the Commerce Clause. And what I'd like to do in a few minutes is to give you some explication as to why it is that a rational basis test looks rather different from the strict scrutiny test, and then leave you to draw the inference with respect to the size of the government involved. Now let me start, first of all, with the uh, tax and spending power. And the reason I do that is that that's actually forced and foremost in the minds of the constitutional framers, Article I, Section 1. And the reason is that the Articles of Confederation had no ways in which to exact monies for the center. And what they wanted to do is to create a system which would allow you to tax and then to spend. And what you could do is they gave you the things that you could tax income and so forth. And then they told you the purposes for which you could spend them. And these included um, for the debt, uh, to provide for the common defense, and to provide for the, basically for the general welfare of the United States. Now, how do you read these things? Well, if you're going to read it correctly, essentially what you do is you understand that they were very reluctant to give this power to the federal government. And so the last thing you want to do is saying, well, we went from the Articles of Confederation where we could do any nothing, and now we're going to a federal constitution where we can do everything. And the basic situation here is a corporate deal. You got these reluctant and suspicious states that are entering to an arrangement. And the fundamental point about any kind of taxation system and so forth is the same about the formation of any corporation, which is you have to persuade people to surrender money to the center. And the only way that you could do that is to make sure that the center cannot redistribute the wealth freely and promiscuously amongst the various members who are shareholders to the business. Everybody here who's ever been in a corporation knows that essentially the anti-redistribution postulate is a minimum condition for being able to get collective wealth in there. And exactly the framers understood that as well. So in effect, they have a way in which you could raise these money. Some of them are limited to being uniform. Income is not, for good reasons, I might add. And then you could do it for a public good, paying off the public debt. You could do it for another public good, which essentially is to provide for the common defense. Or you could do it for another public good, the general welfare of the United States, where the correct minimum condition is that everything that you're trying to do there has to benefit one if it's going to benefit others, that is for non-excludable goods. 
Now, there are many questions as to how you define an excludable and non-excludable good, but the one thing that is clearly on the other side of the line is any kind of transfer payments between individuals or states, because that violates the fundamental proposition about how it is that we organize a collective endeavor, i.e. the anti-redistribution principle. Well, let me just mention a couple of programs that may run into difficulty under this. <laughs> Unemployment. <laughs> Um, uh, basically, I could list the federal budget, and I would be not too far off. What's more of it today is than anything else is transfer payments. And so you have unemployment benefits, you have Medicare, you have Medicaid, you have Social Security, you have food stamps, you have everything. Now, why is it that there were no systematic challenges to this? Well, a rational basis type mentality was used with respect to the standing condition, so that when the first of these programs, the Maternity Act, came forward, nobody could challenge it because nobody had standing. Uh, they completely mangled the Constitution because equitable powers are designed to enjoin abuses ultra virus by governments, just as they are designed in corporate law to prevent derivative suits to prevent these kinds of things. And then when you start going forward, all these programs go. So if you look at the grievous situation, he says, in effect, nothing that you can do by way of the coordination of shared programs does the slightest bit of good except putting good money after bad, which becomes bad money after which you put more. None of these programs are permissible at the original device. And so the great tragedy is when you sort of overwhelm this stuff, uh, there's no second tier set of doctrines in place which will allow you to prevent the massive confusion from uh, taking place. Well, how did we get there? It was our good friend, the rational basis test. Uh, you go and you look at the Cardozo opinions written in a case called Helmring and Davis, and what he does is he sheds crocodile tears over his inability to find clear and rational lines that would allow you to turn the this from the that, and because it's so, so difficult, we have to trust to the benevolence of Congress to do it right. Essentially, what happens is rational basis leads to intellectual co incoherence, and intellectual incoherence leads to massive deference. And once you start down that road, the train has left the station, and you will not be able to harness it. The truth about the matter is, everything we're trying to do is rear guard actions of one sense or another. You can't go beyond. Now let's see, we're trying to do the Commerce Clause. And it turns out, what does the strict constructionist say about commerce? Well, the first thing you do is you look at every standard book written at the time, and the word commerce is always used in opposition to words like manufacture, like agriculture, and like mining. And the reason they drafted it that way, and much of the Constitution is heavily influenced by this, is they did not want to allow the federal government to control slavery inside the state. What happens is the good consequence of this bad motivation is that it essentially created a classical liberal model of government in which the United States could regulate the way in which the network was put together so that no state could sever it, but it could not regulate production within states such that competition across state lines in manufacture, agriculture, and mining could in effect start to take place. Uh, the bad part about this, which was very clear, is when they talked about foreign commerce, their view was that protectionism was the prime good. This was Madison's, not Madison's view, it was Hamilton's view and it was Story's view. And the Foreign Commerce Clause was designed to regulate that. Whereas at the same time on domestic commerce, these guys were all internal free traders. Uh, when you start betting the, the effort of aggrandizement at the federal government, what you do is you invoke the strangulation thesis which says, in effect, we can only regulate interstate commerce, to be sure, but if you want to ship anything into interstate commerce, you have to make sure that no child label is used by any firm that wants to ship those things, at which point you regulate manufacture by the doctrine of unconstitutional conditions. That was struck down in Hammer and Dagenhart when they tried it through taxes. The same thing was struck down in the child labor tax cases a couple of years ago. And so essentially what happened is that the Commerce Clause could not overrun its boundaries, and you had something that looked like a free trade. So by the time you get to the same year, roughly 1937, uh, all of this stuff goes down the side. Everybody starts to say the conceptual game, I do not know what means by commerce. You scratch your head, your IQ goes down to five points, and all of a sudden you dither about the question as to whether these lines work. We don't know what direct means. We don't know what indirect means. What we do is we become essentially slobbering illiterates in order to make sure that since we don't understand what's going on, that only benevolent Congress can do something about it. Uh, an eminent judge, Lawrence Friedman, not Lawrence Friedman, God forbid, I mean Lawrence Silverman, um, said we really need to have Congress to solve national problems that need national solutions. The difficulty with that argument, as I like to say, is the national problem is indeed Congress which cannot solve itself. <laughs> and, and so you have to worry about very sharp structural limitations. 
So what's the difference between the two systems? Well, at this point, the difference is between the National Labor Relations Act in Wicked and Filburn and the Agricultural Adjustment Acts, both of which are dead bang unconstitutional under the earlier systems, and both of which become constitutional once rational basis, linguistic indeterminism, the doctrine of multiple effects takes over. Uh, so what you do is essentially the choice of text at this particular line is in fact a thousand-fold increase in the size of government. If you do not have the rational basis test, then you have to start reading things carefully, worry about their limitations, worry about their relationships to standard theory. And if you do all of those things, uh, this is a case in which the original public meaning stuff works out quite well. It doesn't handle every kind of case. Uh, it doesn't handle two problems, which I'm going to put aside. Uh, one of them is you then have to figure out how the doctrine of implication works with this, the doctrine of the police power, the doctrine of unconstitutional conditions, both of which remain uh, with respect to uh, all this stuff. And it also doesn't exactly tell you when it is that you need to lower the standard of scrutiny, to which my rough answer in a sentence is, when the government is acting under a managerial rather than a regulatory situation, the business judgment rule ought to take over, uh, rather than the strict scrutiny rule. And of course, Justice Roberts has a rare double. He applies the rational basis test to the government as a regulator, and then with affirmative action and similar issues, he's all of a sudden a strict scrutiny guy in an area where you really need to have legislative judgment. And so it turns out that uh, you're not dealing with just random error. It's systematic, uninformed, this jurisprudence, which is going to lead us astray in both of these kinds of areas. So we have a lot to repent for, and Obamacare, at least in its jurisprudence, has only solidified the rather feeble, in my judgment, and largely incoherent set of doctrines that we have to labor with in this desperate effort to figure out how it is that we control a state whose runaway side means that we're not facing a fiscal cliff. We are facing multiple cliffs fiscal and regulatory, which will be with us for a long time until we first reverse our views as to what the Constitution is about and then our views of what we can achieve through regulation and taxation. There's a lot of work to be done. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Professor Epstein. Uh, rational basis test. So the, the, the I want to I turn back to Adam here because Professor Epstein's made the argument that it's the standard of review and not the departure from the first principles that that's the real problem here. How would you react to that, Adam? <coughs> well, you know, I, I think that the, uh, I'm going to try to take it easy on Professor Epstein here, you know. I, I, uh, I can hear his knees knocking. But, uh, but, but to be fair, I, I, I think there may be cases where, uh, where, you, where you need levels of scrutiny. I'm not sure. The, the whole, uh, this tripartite idea of rational basis, strict scrutiny, intermediate scrutiny, it's all judge made. And I'm not convinced that you need it. When you have litigation, you have to have, somebody, ha the court has to have rules of engagement. The court has to decide who has the burden of proof, who has the burden of persuasion. But the level of scrutiny have typically been used to, as a reason for government to justify why they should get away with something that's an admitted violation of the Constitution. So it grew up in the First Amendment free speech context where, you know, they want to say, well, why can we put communists in prison? Well, we're going we're gonna to have this test that says if it's compelling enough, you can put commies in prison. Um, very tellingly, uh, you know, the, when the court revived the Second Amendment recently in the Heller case and then following in the McDonald case, a lot of scholars said, why didn't Justice Scalia tell us what should be the future standard for judging um, uh, for, for, for judging uh, uh, challenges under the Second Amendment uh, because in his decision in Heller, Justice Scalia didn't lay out any strict scrutiny, rational basis, intermediate scrutiny. Um, and the reason is, as, as I think uh, Judge Kavanaugh correctly said in the, in the Heller 2 case when, when the D.C. law uh, came, revised D.C. law came back, D.C. said he didn't need to. Uh, you know, th there's no reason why a, a court, Supreme Court or any other court, should say, here are the tests by which government can justify depriving you of your right to keep and bear arms. The touchstone is the text and history of the amendment, and that should guide courts, and you don't need to have levels of scrutiny. Interesting. Now, I, I, <laughs> before we turn back to Professor Epstein, I want to I turn back to Professor Rosencrantz a little bit, because a couple other things that, that uh, Professor Epstein said uh, peak my brain a little bit based on, on my knowledge of, of, of uh, Nick's research. And the, the, the first is sort of Professor Epstein's assertion that the real problem was a standing problem uh, to an extent that uh, you couldn't uh, bring an objection 
Uh, and, and that sort of turns to the flip side of your theory, the objects of the Constitution. Uh, explain to us a little bit, first of all, what we're talking about to the, to the lay audience here when we talk about a standing uh, question and, and how your theory sheds some light on that. All right, so uh, standing is this doctrine. The question is uh, who should get to sue? Who should get to complain? So if you allege that uh, alleging the Constitution has been violated is one thing, but why are you the proper plaintiff to complain about this? Why, why do you get to come into court to complain about this? And uh, what I want to say is uh, who should get to complain, who should get to come into court is absolutely derived from who you think violated the Constitution in the first place. So uh, again, going back to my sort of First Amendment and Fourth Amendment examples, Fourth Amendment binds the executive branch, has to do with uh, searches, and it binds the executive from doing certain kinds of searches. Because that's a fact-specific inquiry, as I described, who's the right person to complain about an unreasonable search? Obviously, it's the victim of the unreasonable search. Right? So it's the person whose house was searched. Right, that's the proper plaintiff. And if you want to go into court and complain that your neighbor was searched in some unreasonable way, we say, well, you don't have standing. You're not the right person to, maybe. It may be that the Constitution was violated, but you're not the right person to complain about that. Again, though, the First Amendment or, for example, the Commerce Clause, clauses that are about legislative action, have a quite a different valence as to this. So if you're complaining about legislative action, you know, in a sense, it shouldn't. It, it doesn't matter as much, or at least it's not obvious why it should matter. Um, how it applies to you, or quite who you are. Um, if Congress makes a law abridging the freedom of speech and violates the Constitution on that day, you know, in a sense, that kind of harms all of us. Sort of chills all of our speech, even before we, you know, contemplate going to give a speech or whatever. Um, if Congress exceeds its power under the Commerce Clause or exceeds its power under the taxing uh, power or whatever, um, these are, because this is a legislative problem, in a sense we should have a much broader, we arguably should have a broader conception of standing when we're complaining about legislative action because in a sense it harms us all. and It harms us all equally on the day when Congress enacts the thing. At least that's a kind of arguable take on standing. All right. But before I go back to Professor Epstein, I want to give <laughs> Professor Grieva if, if 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 you've got any comments here before we turn back to Richard. Um, no, I just want to sound one one note of um, caution. Um, this isn't just the New Dealers who did this to you or us. Okay, some of the dis decisions that sort of Absolutely. lurk in the background here. Mm -hmm. um, so the the earliest case. Um, about these these matters, or at, in, at any rate, the decisive case. It's a pair of cases from 1923, and they're called Frothingham versus Mellon and Massachusetts versus Mellon. This is about the earliest version of um, uh, of what later became AFDC and is now TANF. And so, Justice Sutherland. Food, food stamps, right? Sutherland, yeah. No, I, no, no. no. Um, uh, infant care, maternal. Infant care. Ma yeah, it was, maternal it was the maternity care. Uh, it's the the Townsend Act or uh, the Maternity Act, sometimes uh, so-called. Um, and th th the pair of cases was very, very carefully uh, constructed. It was a test case. Uh, and Massachusetts, the com coercion it complained about was, was not sort of the, the coercive conditions that came with the statute because there weren't that many. It complained that if it Massachusetts opted out of the program, the its stopped. citizens would still have to pay their portion of, I mean, pay, still pay taxes to the federal government. Uh, and it was just Sutherland writing for a unanimous court saying the citizens don't have standing and the state doesn't have standing either and everybody out of here. Okay, this is not an invention of um, Justice Brandeis or, um, uh, or, or Justice Cardozo. Um, and by the same token, the spending clause, or sorry, there is no spending clause, as Nick Rosencrantz would promptly remind us. There's a spending power, uh, even if it's not totally clear where it comes from. Um, the broad conception of the spending power um, that Richard Epstein inveighs against uh, with some justice um, was also not an invention of the New Deal. It came 
considerably before the New Deal with the support of the conservative justices. So if you want to recover something, uh, you really have to, in a, in a sense, go back to the way things never have been. Yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> but on the other with, hand, with that, Professor no, Epstein, let's let's hear yeah, your reaction. But he did not finish the sentence the way they never were, but the way they should have been from the outset, right? I mean, let me sort of just go back and start on the standing point, and then go back to some of the other points about differential standards of review. I think that the answer to this particular question does not only come from the subjects and objects of the power, but it comes from the structure of Article Three. Article 3 says the judicial power of the United States shall extend to all cases in law and equity arising on. Now, to many people, the words law and equity are just gibberish. It just means cases. It's not. If you go back to the historical period, there was a huge debate going back to Coke and Ellesmere as to whether or not you were going to give various kinds of equitable powers of injunctions. And the theory was that they were so great and so abusive that they were an adjunct to royal power that you had to cut them out. When they had the debate at the Constitution, they realized we don't have bad King George, and so either we have an equitable court or we cannot use injunctions and other kinds of remedies. An equitable remedy in the corporate context is that you can enjoin ultra-virus acts of a corporation because there is a free rider and a coordination problem. Uh, the unbearable mistake, the inexcusable blunder at the federal level, starting with Sutherland and going through every modern judge, including Scalia, is that their test of direct and pocketbook redressable injury is the test for damage at law. That's the individual case. It has never been the test for standing with respect to equity under England or anywhere else. You go to New York State, then you want to be able to enjoin a state or, or a municipal action as being ultra virus the authority, you can do it by way of an injunction. And what our friend Sutherland said is, oh, you can't use those precedents at the federal level because there are many more people at the federal level than the state. Well, once you get over 100, the numbers don't matter. And in fact, the greater the number of people, the more important it is to have equitable remedies. So this guy is so far off base that, I mean, it's just <laughs> unbelievable, the sheer level of intellectual incompetence um, that led to that decision, notwithstanding its <laughs> unanimous judgment. There's no point in missing words. There is nobody there who actually started to do this right. And it turned out that Holmes actually did know something about equitable jurisprudence, but he was a constitutional fatalist. He thought that anything the people wanted to do, we ought not to interfere with. And what Mike then says is 100% correct, is that if you can't stop the other, them from taking your money, the only thing left to you to do is to join into the trolley. That is, they put you into a prisoner's dilemma game. So either you stop the whole program if it's illegal, staying out of the program is worse. And they knew that, and it was unforgivable that they did that. Sutherland, it was not an accident. When somebody tried to enjoin in the Alabama case the competitor, they couldn't sue either, because it was, quote, damn them ab scrandiori, an old common law notion, which naturally he systematically misapplies. But that's another detail. On the question of, of, of the thing, I disagree with Adam on the issue of differential standards, and let me explain why. I mean, we say Congress shall pass no law. In the next case is what Congress does is pass a law which allows the military to organize its internal operations and so forth. And the Supreme Court is on my side on this. This is not unattainable. When, it, when you work for the government, some of your rights at least you have to give up by virtue of the fact that the government controls you first as an employer as well as a regulator. And it cannot be that if I work for the government and get information, I'm free to blab it around everywhere else. And the test you have to ask is whether other employers in voluntary situations impose similar conditions, at which point the government generally can do so. So we do have the differential standards. And when you don't see that kind of thing, uh, then you get yourself into lots of problems. And affirmative action is exactly that case. Nobody knows how to run a private institution well. And there's nobody who runs a private institution that's serious about it that doesn't have some kind of so-called affirmative action programs for reasons that vary from profane to profound. And my view is you've got to give some wiggle room or you can't run public institutions at all. Now, the last point I wanted to mention is about the, the other case, the... Uh, the gun case. I think Scalia has messed this up beyond recognition, and it's because he does not do the first thing that you do with any clause, which is to read the whole thing. And this begins with the question about you know a well-regulated initial being uh, um, initial militia being essential for the security of a free state. You can't treat those words as simply precatory, getting it out, and say that the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. 
What's going on in that particular case is if you look at the rest of the Constitution, there is a complex division of power over the organization of the military uh, between the militia and the army, which is in Article I, Section 16, 17, 18, whatever the numbers are, I think they are. And what they're saying, in effect, is if you've got to organize things like this, um, the federal government cannot limit the way in which the states operate because otherwise it's going to upset the deal that has been created in Article I. So the only place to which the militia clause or to which the, um, the Second Amendment doesn't apply is, of course, D.C., I mean, because there's no interaction. And the only other thing that it doesn't cover is state regulations of states because what you were trying to do was a structural provision to preserve state autonomy, and that's simply not what's at stake in a case like McDonald. So you, as a matter of statutory and constitutional construction, to say that 14 words in a text are precatory, and then introducing 14 other words on the police power, and say that those have to be read, it can't be original public meaning to strike out words that are there as irrelevant, and original public meaning to add in those which are not necessary. And so I think there's serious defects on this kind of system, whatever you happen to think about gun control or anything else of the sort. Anyhow, that, that's my right, remarks. Those, those are some very controversial statements, which I'm sure folks on the panel disagree with, at least in part. I, but, but I do want to open up for audience questions, and then perhaps we can, we can get some discussion. People but, 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 but I, but I, I do want to open up for audience questions for those oh, who have it. Please wait until you get the microphone. Uh, please d describe who you are, and uh, please keep it short in the form of a question. Up here, Tom. There seem to be... Uh, I, I work in commercial real estate. Uh, there seems to be fodder for additional challenges to the constitutionality of the Supreme Court. And hopefully you can give us some hope that there is. Secondly, there seems to be... You're talking about Obamacare specifically? Obamacare, excuse me. Apologies. Secondly, there seems to be so much that's degraded about our original intent that we may be approaching the need for another constitutional convention. God help us. If you could comment upon those. Uh, I, I'm going to... Go first to Nick on this, Professor Rosencrantz. Uh, further challenges, particularly. Well, there, there's, uh, I think there are talk of further challenges to different aspects of Obamacare. I'd say I'm not particularly optimistic about any of those, but I think you, you will see some more litigation about that. I'm certainly not in favor of any kind of constitutional convention, but you know the people should certainly consider the possibility of amending their constitution. So it has a mechanism built in, which is Article Five, and uh, you, you know the the um, the primary challenge to, as Adam will tell you, the primary challenge to original public meaning, uh, the original public meaning theory of constitutional interpretation is well. Why, why do we want to be governed by these dead white men, right? They, they wrote this document, you know, uh, centuries ago, and surely it's irrelevant to uh, the, they couldn't possibly have imagined all the problems that we face now, and surely it's, uh, it's uh, archaic and we should move beyond it. And, uh, you know, a powerful answer to that is to say the thing has built in a mechanism for its own change. So if you do not like it, it shouldn't be changed by judges. It should be changed by the mechanism that it itself provides. And uh, it's not impossible. So the thing has been amended uh, 27 times, which is, uh, on average, better than once per decade. It can be done. So if you don't like it, um, amend it. That's what I would say. It, it, further comments on that question from other folks on the panel? Well, Adam? I, you know, I just on the, <clears throat> on the subject of the convention, I'm a I'm a big supporter of it in the sense of an Article Five convention. I don't propose that we should get people together and start with a blank slate. Mm. And the reason why I support an Article Five convention is because the Constitution gives you two ways to amend the Constitution. One, you start with Congress, and the other way is you uh, get enough states to insist on on a convention to propose amendments. And as Professor Epstein pointed out, Congress is the problem. Congress will never report out amendments that will make the structural changes um, that at least I believe are necessary um, to try to rein in the federal government back to something resembling its original scope. And so um, it is not an impossible dream. We've actually come, I think, one or two states shy in the 1980s of, a, of an amending convention to uh, examine the balanced budget uh, amendment, for example, and the, the remaining states were bought off by the graham rudman hollings bill, which ended up being a complete failure. Um, and so we, we, we should have uh, an Article 5 convention, I, I think, and uh, nothing would get 
ratified unless three quarters of state legislatures approve it. So it would have to have broad support. Professor Greva? Uh, yeah, just a quick uh, word about uh, Obamacare and future litigation. There are two kinds of uh, challenges that are out there. Uh, one is this commandeering issue that I mentioned. Um, and I'm not totally pessimistic about it. There's a lawsuit pending uh, on, on that score. It's being brought or has been brought by Oklahoma. This is a statutory um, uh, challenge, which is uh, which John Adler um, and, and Mike Cannon at, at Cato uh, have, have outlined, uh, which I think may also uh, have some real legs. Um, the, uh, on top of it, uh, look, of course, this statute, if it ever sort of goes fully into effect, will be accompanied by hundreds and thousands of lawsuits, right? The thing is, I don't know how, how however many pages, 1,200 or 1,600 pages long. 2,300. 2,300 well, pages. Thank you, Richard. Yeah. Depending on how you count and whether you count the footnotes and all the rest of it. Look, the Supreme Court hears three or four ERISA cases every year, and ERISA is to this statute as a tricycle is to an aircraft carrier. <laughs> so, it, you know, it, it, Right, it, I, mean, I, I presume what you wanted to know is whether there are any any uh, uh, challenges out there um, it, it, that might make a dent into the statute, and and the two I I mentioned I think have that potential, assuming that the statute itself survives in its current form long enough uh, to deserve a dent. Um, a, couple of, a couple of comments on this. Um, first of all, about the question of our archaic. Uh, original conception. Uh, this is such a profound misunderstanding of what political theory tells you. It's like saying classical theory of contract law doesn't work for aircraft carriers, it only works for bicycle. Well, it turns out the mechanism is adapted, and if the fundamental question is faction, which it always turns out to be, an anti-redistributive set of rules are as important today as they were then, only more so. If it turns out that what you need to do is to make sure that the network is open for interstate competition, uh, then it's going to be extremely important that you either have the Dormant Commerce Clause or Congress doing that thing. If it turns out that cartels were bad in ancient Rome and they're bad today, then you don't want to have a National Labor Relations Act and you don't want to have an Agricultural Adjustment Act. There is absolutely nothing this, and what I find so astonishing is these guys have basically turned this Constitution upside down, not only in the grievous sense on federalism, but on everything. It has produced a series of absolute catastrophic confrontations that we are now facing on an annualized basis, all which make Hurricane Can Sandy look relatively small. And the guys who are facing this stuff now pronounce the brilliant success of their new constitutional government system, which shows every sign of complete destruction on the ground. So I don't understand where that theory comes from. They don't have a theory. Their theory is cartels are great when organized by governments because you could pay off your friends. This is not, to my mind, a sort of social theory that you want to respect. So that's the um, first point that we want to deal with. On the second point, on a constitutional convention, I I'm kind of agnostic because I don't think that it's going to move you in the right direction with a probability of greater than 0.5. That is, you could start talking about something like the Graham, Hollins, Rudman, or why not, you know, the balanced budget amendment. And what it could turn up is that that's the topic, and you'll get the grotesquely unbalanced budget amendment coming out of there, which essentially will basically authorize selective funding mechanisms of the sort that the president wants to do. And of course, the uniform taxes are an huge protection against government abuse. And when one starts to think about this as a matter of equity, as the president always seems to think it is, uh, what happens is the gross stuff goes on the wrong side. If you recall, uh, a wizard from Hyde Park thought they'd have 4% growth rate with the programs he wanted to put into place. He's only off by somewhere between 2 and 2.5, two and maybe 3%. You take 2.5%, you compound it over five years, all of a sudden you got 15, 18% more GDP in this country than we have today, and a lot of your problems will disappear. Uh, but I don't think there's any explicit acknowledgement on the part of our great leaders uh, that you actually do have a trade-off going somewhere. They obviously seem to assume that bad rates are deus ex machina, that if you only put Paul Krugman in charge of the Treasury Department, all these problems will disappear. Uh, but I have to tell you, these are deep structural issues. And until you get a public which understands its own complicity in all of what's going on, 
uh, there's no point in having a constitutional convention. Better that we have debates. Better that we get this on C-SPAN. Better that C-SPAN turns it over to PBS, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We've got time for one more question. I want to go there in the back, please. One row. Uh, if each panelist in one sentence could, could give the strongest argument against Obamacare, uh, why should it be unconstitutional? How many words in each sentence? 140 characters. We'll start, start with Professor Grieva, and then we'll, we'll go left. We'll go to the far left, yeah. Um, look, I believe the Medicaid holding is a mess. I believe the tax holding, now it comes. I believe that the Chief Justice is right on the tax issue, and I believe that he's right on, uh, that the majority is right uh, on, the, on the Commerce Clause issue. So that's where we are. Adam. <coughs> Obamacare, the Obamacare decision is wrong and the, and the underlying statute is wrong because the general welfare taxation power never gave Congress the ability to do an end run, to, uh, end run around its enumerated powers. And there is clearly, even as the Supreme Court recognized, no enumerated power to force people into the insurance market. Professor Rosencrantz. I guess I'd say this brings me back full circle to the difference between lawyers and non-lawyers. So for lawyers, these are difficult questions, all this doctrine about the Commerce Clause and the Spending Clause and whatnot. Non-lawyer, what you do is you crack open Article I, Section 8, and read through this list of powers that Congress has. There are 18 little clauses. It's not so long. You can read it in five minutes. You can think about each one in five minutes. And uh, none of them are at all plausible for the enacting of Obamacare on the text of the thing, on the words that are on the page. You know, I think for non-lawyers, it's actually quite an easy question. It's only lawyers and their doctrine that make, make these things yeah. so difficult. I mean, one does, sentence. Okay. One sentence. Professor, yeah, one <laughs> sentence. I can't do that. That was a long but, sentence. It was an Epstein <laughs> sentence. <laughs> Professor Epstein. If, if I had to think of, in terms of current doctrine, the single worst aspect of the Obamacare decision by Justice Roberts, Chief Justice. It's that until this time, we always thought the end run point was in fact a fair one. You can't use the commerce power uh, or the taxing power where the commerce power doesn't go. And the moment he says, oh, we can't get it under commerce, but we can get it under taxation, the very case that he cited for it, which was the child labor case, stands for exactly the opposite proposition. So it was completely disingenuous use of authority. And the question about whether or not we can tax in action has the following absurdity. As I last counted, there were 4,987,000,000 things that I'm not doing at this moment, and each of them is subject to taxation. Um, it's just a kind of a joke. That is, you go through the entire history, and essentially non-performance has always been subject to penalties if you want to do it, and you have to be careful as to which ones you pick. And so he picks the kind of thing which is so odd that you know it's not a serious precedent because given the catastrophe that one will see when Obamacare unravels as it will, uh, nobody will ever try a mandate again. So this is a one-horse wonder, um, and it's not a very so, good horse. So I think we all agree on the policy. There's no, no. common agreement, the policy being bad. <laughs> There's common agreement here on the constitutional question. I do want to come back briefly before we close to Professor Griva, who... Uh, I think disagrees from the other three panelists on, on the taxing power nature of the, the Roberts decision. In other words, saying while, while he agrees with the decision that this is unconstitutional use of the commerce plow, power, that the taxing power question is, 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 is a plausible interpretation from the Chief Justice. And Michael, I just want to give you a, a brief chance to, to back that up. I believe that the tax power, the power to tax extends beyond the limits of uh, the commerce power or other enumerated powers that are in the Constitution. It's the power to tax. It is a fearsome power. You ought to be afraid of it. But there you have it. What I think is doubtful about the opinion and where the dissenters are really right is that the question of whether this tax has to be apportioned or not is really, really, really difficult. And they did this on the basis of, what, 19 lines of briefing and one paragraph of briefing. Had this been any other case I think they would have ordered this case for rebriefing and re-argument, but 
you know, here we were in whatever it was, June 2012, they weren't going to do that, and so the chief decided to wing it. Um, and that part of the opinion is really, really unpersuasive to, to my mind, but on the general authority, uh, I, I believe that he's right. Fascinating. Well, unfortunately, we're going to have to, to just I tick our time. Let's word. give. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to thank all our panelists. I want to. I want to tell everyone as as you're leaving. Uh, please make sure that you fill out your review forms uh, uh, and sign up for the CLE credit if you're looking for continuing legal education credit. For those of you in the room, uh, I want to thank all of you for coming and thank our distinguished panelists. Fascinating discussion. I think it is clear how fortunate we are to believe in the power of ideas. Supply the common sense and the fresh thinking of the Manhattan Institute.